Thanks be to God. Thank you, John Wynn. Thank you, worship team. Can we thank these guys? They got a key change in there for us. That was nice. Uh, well, welcome again, everyone. Happy New Year. My name's Eric. I'm the lead pastor here at Bethany Green Lake. Uh, I'm really excited that the center of our worship today uh, is sharing at this table and in, in sharing communion together. Uh, but before we do that, I want to uh, talk with us uh, on the theme of priests, kings, and the pursuit of the good life. Priests, kings, and the pursuit of the good life. So join me in prayer as we jump in. Uh, God, we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, it is beautiful. God, we don't always understand it, and yet we need it. We thank you that it wasn't uh, written to us, but it's written for us. And so we want to understand uh, what you had to say then and what you're saying to us now. Um, God, I pray that you would uh, invite us to be your people uh, in the world uh, for a needy world. Uh, but God, starting with our own hearts, would you shape our hearts uh, this morning? We love you. In your name, amen. Well, uh, today we're beginning a new act in our year-long series uh, through the Bible. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is actually a great time uh, to hop in. Each of you should have received the companion guide when you came in. If you're joining us online, it's at churchbcc.org slash rooted. Uh, we're calling it, uh, this act four, uh, Fragments, Glimmers of Hope. Over the next six weeks, we're going to look at biblical Israel's journey from 1 Samuel through Malachi, really the rest of the Old Testament, stopping at some critical points along uh, the way on Sundays, along sort of the arc of their journey, and certainly pointing out the hope found in Christ uh, made visible along the way. Uh, but today, we're going to pick up the story where the Israelites look around and they say, uh, you know, life would be better if. Life would be better if. Each of us live pretty different lives uh, than, than God's people did 3,000 years ago. Uh, but similarly, uh, one similarity sort of jumps off the page uh, to me. And it's this, that we too look around, probably more so, uh, no more so than right now at the beginning of a new year, and sort of ask the question. And we say, life would be better if. Each of us have a list. Our lists look a little differently, but every New Year's resolution or, or intention or, or hopeful thought to start or stop something. Maybe you've already fallen off your wagon already. That's okay. It's, it's your wagon. I think God is inviting us to something different today. But these things are about pursuing a better life. And this is why I want to begin with considering the term, the good life. Uh, now, this term may sound sort of hedonistic in some way, like we're painting a picture of, of excess, like I saw recently just a picture of a yoked, absolutely yoked Jeff Bezos on his super yacht. I think it's one of those ones that has other yachts that park inside the yacht, like in case you want to just take the smaller yacht today. Or I saw a picture recently of Leonardo DiCaprio and a bunch of 21-year-olds, again, on a yacht. It's always a yacht in like St. Bart's. Or you flip through the beginning of, of sort of Vogue or Vanity Fair, there are these images of, of glamour. Now, it's true that most of us don't, either don't want that life or can't afford that life or both, but the truth remains that we're all seeking the good life. To quote James K.A. Smith, he's a, a philosopher uh, and theologian, he says, it's not a question, a question of whether you're chasing the good life, it's only a question of which, what version. To be human is to be the kind of creature who's animated by some vision of flourishing, some picture of what you think a well-lived life looks like. And Smith goes on to explain Aristotle's belief that every human being is wired in such a way that we're pursuing some good, some telos was his term, some end goal that actually then pulls a way of life out of us. St. Augustine put it this way, is not the happy life that which all desire, which indeed no one fails to desire? It's everybody. And so whether we realize it or not, we're all in search of the good life. And the examples of the Israelites and Samuel and Saul are found in our text for today provide windows into how it's found. And it's here that we pick up the Israelites' story. Your bulletin outline has three fill-in-the-blanks if you appreciate some handles uh, along the way as you, as you listen and take notes. If you take notes, that's not a requirement from me. But the first is this, and it applies to us as much as it did to them back then. Don't look over the fence. That's your first one. Don't look over the fence. 
You heard it as John Wayne read for us uh, in this patriarchal culture, uh, Samuel, who was a judge, uh, then a prophet, who also functioned as a priest. He was old. The scripture began, Samuel, you are old. Uh, I sort of laugh at that. And his sons weren't fit for service. So the Israelites looked around very practically and said, we need a king. We're going to need a leader. Now they knew that God was their king, but all the other nations had a human king. It's hard for me as a dad not to read a little tone into their uh, request. It sounds familiar. All the other nations have a king. This was in my house last night. All the other kids have a cell phone dad and an Apple watch and an Xbox and Jordan 11s. I'm like, how do you know what Jordan 11s are? That's a shoe, the greatest Jordan ever made. First of all, I say, no, they don't. Though I understand it may feel that way, children. And second of all, parents, I wonder if we could just have a sidebar and get our kind of story straight and determine together, uh, we need some consistency. What drip are we going to provide for our kids and when? Because I can't keep up financially and I'm trying, desperately trying to keep my kids' kids as long as possible. Read a book, go outside, draw a picture, Okay, I'm back. End rant. (laughs) What Israel was forgetting, as my kids forget, and hear me, they are good kids. Uh, What they're forgetting is that this family is set apart, or at least we're intending to be. We're trying to do things a different way. God said to Israel, I am your king, your God, and you are my people. We are going to swim together upstream in pursuit of a new and better way. But Israel looked over the fence. They looked over the border and saw that the other nations had human kings who could lead them into into battle, among other things. And it is true that they were rejecting God as king, if more so, uh, no more so than God said that it's true to Samuel. But there's some nuance that I don't want us to, to miss here. It wasn't that they didn't want God to be their king, they wanted God in the picture, but they asked for a king so that they didn't have to wait on God to act on their behalf. They wanted a king who could exercise God's power in battle and over their enemies. They wanted God's power, but they didn't want God's control. God, just give us what we need down here and we'll take care of the rest. And looking over the fence was about the perceived freedom and power that other nations had in their pursuit of the good life. Winning battles, taking land, onward and upward. And friends, oftentimes this is us in our pursuit of the good life. If we're honest, we want to sprinkle in a little Jesus to our upward mobility and call it faith. But God doesn't want to be a resource for us. He wants to be the source for us. God does not want to be used, but rather wants to be known. The joy we find in Jesus as our satisfaction is stolen when we compare. So we're not to look over the fence and say, my life would be better if... Because here's the real truth for us and for Israel. Whatever that thing we're seeking is, when we have that, that person or, or, or that job or that house or our health or that much money saved up or we take that trip, whatever it is for us, it doesn't really change our lives because we don't change. I'm telling you that thing we want changing won't change things because we aren't changed, really changed in our hearts at the core of who we are. So if the good life is is found in in our weight or how healthy our skin looks or our LDL levels or our resting heart rate or our downhill uh, ski speed, now I'm just preaching to Richard. (laughs) If the good life is found in these things, we're gonna be disappointed because as Richard has taught and modeled so well for so long, it's found in living out of Christ's life within you. It's a change of source. And next week, Richard will will be here uh, looking with us at at King David. And while there's a lot that he didn't nail in his life, Psalm 25 gives us a a window into something he did really well, consistently, uh, in times of plenty and want and times of failure. Psalm 25 begins with David saying, to you, O Lord, I lift my soul. Now, the soul encompasses our, our mind and our will and emotions And as David uh, lifts his soul, he's asking God to shape him. He's desiring God's spirit within him, that which God breathed into him 
at his birth that gives him life. He's asking that to be the source. And if that's an intriguing to you, there's a, there's a four-week uh, class, sort of a core discipleship class here at Bethany called Spirit, Soul, Body, uh, starting Tuesday. Uh, it breaks down the journey toward, toward wholeness in this interactive way. Richard and Abby and others have, have been a part of the content for that. Just encourage you to sign up. But God is steadfast and kind and patient with us as we slowly learn, sometimes too slowly, that the good life is found in walking with God, allowing him to shape us little by little. And I want you to know, uh, or maybe that's, maybe that's what you need today, uh, to, to stop looking over the fence, to, to stop running after this and that, and instead walk with God. There's a sort of a cultural norm that we're all kind of in the midst of in this moment at the beginning of the new year to just sprint. And I just think it mostly leads to burnout. And maybe you're feeling that already. Perhaps it's time to, it's time to slow down. Perhaps it's time to, to get quiet, to let the ground lay fallow in the winter in order that in a real and a spiritual sense, new life might come in the spring. And I want you to know, I I don't do this well. Uh, I'm preaching to myself as much as anyone. Anytime I'm here, that's what you're gonna get from me. I'm prone to chasing all kinds of stuff. I love cool and shiny things, especially. That's probably where my kids get it from. I think these things in some way, if I'm honest, will, will complete me. That in them, the good life might be found. I could rattle off my four favorite possessions faster than I can tell you the last four prayers that God answered in my life. And I know this because I was sitting in my hot tub the other day, one of my four favorite possessions. Uh, These should have been the fill in the blanks, Eric's four favorite possessions. I was thinking about this, and it's not because God doesn't answer prayer. It's because I look to my stuff to meet my needs over what God actually offers. The reality is I don't even ask most of the time. I probably don't ask because it doesn't feel right to ask God for the latest thing that I've looked over the fence and decided than I need in my life. You know, God, my life would be better if. But you know, the beautiful thing is actually that God wants us to ask. So much of his provision in our lives is actually just his presence as he walks with us through every want and desire, every hurt, every need, every season and situation. His provision is in his presence. He wants to meet us in our desires and our longings to to fulfill us. I heard someone say once, I want to reach for God like I reach for my phone. Boy, that gets me, right? The invitation is for us as it was for Israel to allow God to be the source in our lives and we can't do that when we're looking over the fence. God says, be holy as I am holy. What does that mean? Holiness in part means set apart for God's use. We are each children of God and God is saying, this is how we do things in our family. Embrace that, relax into that as you begin a new year. Our second window into finding the good life, uh, don't take matters into your own hands. Don't look over the fence. Don't take matters into your own hands. Sometimes we ignore instructions because uh, we think we don't need them. And sometimes we ignore instructions because we feel sort of backed into a corner. Plan A is out the window. And so it's part of our way of life. I don't know if you've watched Man vs. Wild, to be like Bear Grylls. And he says, improvise, adapt, overcome. It's this very uh, kind of a modern American vision. Well, years ago, I I found myself in a situation. I tried to do this. I was putting together a large TV stand from Ikea. And now you know where this story's going. It had bookshelves and drawers. uh, And so I laid out all the pieces, as you do, get rid of all the cardboard And I quickly scanned the instruction manual and then sort of flippantly tossed it, like, I got this. The reality is I did not got this uh, because uh, I did not notice, I hadn't put the drawers in yet, uh, it wasn't super obvious that there was a clear front and back. There was a correct way to put this thing together. And I don't know if you've ever noticed a dress or a TV stand, they all sort of come with this really... uh, cheap, thin, particle board backing and those little tiny pain-in-the-butt nails. Uh, And so I proceeded to take like 30 of these nails and hammer them into this backing, and I put the back of this thing right on the front. Uh, And then I flipped it over only to discover my error that, no, I actually just covered up where the drawers go, uh, and I also just put a million holes into the front of this new thing. 
Uh, and so left with no choice but to embrace my idiocy and cover my tracks, I proceeded to slowly pull this thing off. Uh, and I just grabbed a Sharpie, because why not? Uh, I was too young in my home improvement journey to know that there's like wood filler and special pens that match the grain. But so I just filled those little holes in, really just to, to hide uh, the, the plywood grain that was now sticking out. I remember for about a year that we used this, I think my wife had pity on me and finally decided she wanted something different. Every time the light came in the window, it would catch every one of those holes <laughs> and expose that the Sharpie was really not a great cover-up uh, to my thing. So King Saul found himself in a much larger but similar situation uh, of ignoring instruction and, and needing to find his own plan B. You heard John Wayne read it for us uh, in 1 Samuel 13. Saul is, he's preparing for battle and he's anxious that an attack from the Philistines is, is imminent. So Samuel had, had told Saul to wait for him at Gilgal so that Samuel as priest could offer sacrifices and then Israel would be spiritually ready for battle. This was very important. Now Samuel said he'd be there in seven days uh, and basically seven days and an hour had passed or maybe seven days and one minute. Uh, so Saul did what honestly many of us would do. He said, well, bring me the stuff. I'll do it. It's good leadership. He'd seen Samuel do it before. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as he finished, like the smell of the burnt offering still in the air, the embers still rising from the fire, Samuel walks in and he says, what have you done? It's a bit more of a rhetorical question, uh, giving Saul the opportunity to kind of reflect for a moment because Samuel knew exactly what Saul had done, but he asked it to give him a chance to repent, acknowledge the wrong. And Samuel replies with this trifecta of excuses. The best excuses are the ones that are also true. And these were true. He says, the men were scattering. Again, not his responsibility. You weren't here, so it's your fault. And the Philistines were coming. And he says, I felt compelled. I had to. I had no other choice. Improvise, adapt, overcome. But the sin of Saul here was in disobeying God's order. A good life is found in accepting God's counsel in our lives, trusting his timing and provision. If only he had waited one more hour, it's there in the scriptures, Samuel would have arrived. And furthermore, the sin of Saul was that kings weren't to act as priests and priests weren't to act as kings. There's a clear dividing line that God had set up. When God says no, desperation or desire doesn't give us license to make it a yes. I think that's a faith principle for us. But there's a deeper sin seen in Saul's taking matters into his own hands. Like the Israelites did in their asking for a human king, desiring God's power to help them win, rather than submitting to him, Saul only offers sacrifices in the first place because he thought it would help them win. Listen to what he said. He said, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. This is very human of Saul. I have a lot of compassion for this. I thought, I was just trying to. Life presents these opportunities to sort of take matters into our own hands. But the Israelites were a worshiping people. This is how they were different than other nations. They were submitted to, to God, as, to Yahweh as, as their king. And Saul used worship to achieve his own ends. And God doesn't want to be used. Again, not a resource, but the source. In this family, we don't sprinkle a little Jesus into our plans as a good luck charm. We wait on the Lord, hard as it is, submitting to his guidance and timing in our lives. Maybe you're in that season now. But God always comes through on Israel's behalf. It's interesting to me that, that Saul's anxiety leading to his taking matters into his own hands is contrasted by, by Samuel's confidence and sort of this non-anxious presence that he carries. You see it throughout his life. You'll read in, in 1 Samuel 7 this week, if you follow the reading plan, it wasn't long before this, just a few chapters back, that at the 11th hour, with their backs to the wall, that God beat the Philistines. And then Samuel set up an, an Ebenezer, they called it, a monument to God's faithfulness. It meant thus far, God has been with us. We sing about it in the song, here I raise my Ebenezer. And it's a reminder to anyone who passed by on the road right then and there that Yahweh, Israel's true God and king, can be trusted. 
But Samuel, or Saul hadn't, hadn't learned this or had forgotten the pressures of, of life and leadership as it often does prove too much. And then right in the text, his anointing as king is removed. Instead of living into his calling as a king in submission to God's direction and timing, he pretended to be a priest and he did it to satisfy the people instead of God. Now God has a calling on each of our lives, which we'll talk about in a moment but we can't walk in it when we're chasing and pretending to be someone else or something else. And as soon as Samuel catches uh, Saul having offered the sacrifice, sort of with his hand in the cookie jar, Saul doubles down. He really acts like a priest. Imagine a kid, uh, a, a mom or a dad catches a child sneaking a cookie and the kid just looks up and says, let's pray. Right, this is essentially what Saul did. It's a great reframe. Saul does this. He, he comes out to greet Samuel. In some translations, it's essentially like this, hey, bless you, brother. Like he, he gets real religious instead of real repentant. He gets real religious instead of real repentant. Now, you may, may be here today thinking, well, I've blown it. I've, I've taken matters into my own hands and are wondering if God has moved on from you. The good news is that God has made a way through Jesus for us to simply turn and go the other way, to start again, ironically inviting all of us to a calling that Saul wasn't to take up, as I'll share in a minute. But first, this is all because of the work of Jesus. I saw a video this week of, a, of an older saint, this man explaining why he, he thinks Jesus put the ear back on uh, the soldier, Malchus, who Peter had cut off. Maybe you remember this story. I'd never really thought about it because of course Jesus would heal the ear. By then you'd seen Jesus perform all, all sorts of miracles. But, but he said, uh, the man explained that, that under Roman law, cutting off someone's ear was a capital offense, punishable by death. And when Jesus reached for that ear and, and put it back on, all the charges that could have been brought against Peter, uh, there were no evidence. Jesus had just taken away all evidence of any transgression all evidence that Peter had transgressed. And he went on to say in this simple but profound way that this is exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. His blood removing all evidence that we had ever transgressed, only seen by God as saints now washed in the water, washed in the blood, holy and set apart for God's use. I love that. There's a good life before us, friends. And the question we started with remains, which version are we seeking? Because the world is full of all sorts of pictures of the good life. These rival stories warring for our attention. And Jesus is inviting us to live the better story. That's our third window into the good life. Live the better story. But what is the better story? Ultimately, the good life we're seeking, as Jamie Smith articulated, is, is some vision of flourishing. Flourishing is this idea of shalom in Hebrew. And the books of Isaiah and Revelation describe these. So I want to read this, listen to this from Isaiah 11. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. And the young child will put its hand in the viper's mouth. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the Lord, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then from Revelation 21, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne, this is Jesus said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And what does this have to do with us right now in 2024 in Seattle? I share these biblical pictures of flourishing, these visions of safety and joy and peace, these images of shalom, because 
The madness of the Christian life is that the good life is found in seeking that vision in the here and now. In our homes and families and workplaces and neighborhoods, are we bearing witness to that better story? Lives surrendered to King Jesus, pursuing his good in the world rather than looking around, looking over the fence or charting our own course, taking matters in our own hands. And this is vital for us to catch because we're very preoccupied with God's will as a roadmap for our lives rather than an identity. In other words, we think of what am I supposed to do instead of what am I becoming? And it's this idea of identity, of calling that we'll turn to briefly as we approach this table together. I mentioned earlier the calling that each of us has. It's the calling that that God gave the Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai. And because of Jesus, it extends to each of us today. The calling in the wilderness came, listen. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Out there in the desert with a pop-up tent for a temple, they were not to have priests, but to be priests. We are called by God something that no one else would dream of calling us, a kingdom of priests set apart. Some translations say a peculiar possession, strange, odd, unexpected, special, particular, God doing something new in and with his people. So we're as image bearers in the world, in our homes and dorms and and at Boeing and Amazon and Microsoft and all the places the wilderness team project manages. We got recovered in, in that in that part. Everything in between, the work uh of a priest isn't, isn't what I do, it's what we do. And most importantly, it's who we are. Friends, this is the good life. This is how we live the better story. Following Jesus, the perfect prophet, priest, and king in his vision of flourishing for all people and taking up our calling as priests to, to honor and wait on and reflect and make him known among the people. That's what that carabiner's about. Priests know and pursue God, and that's our highest calling together in this new year. I'll close with this quote from A.W. Tozer. He says, the more we know God, the more we'll desire to translate the newfound knowledge into deeds of mercy towards suffering humanity. So as we come to, to this table, the act of communion is a deed of mercy, We remember Jesus who who on behalf of suffering humanity offered his life. And when we share this meal, we declare his reign until he returns. So we taste and see, friends, of these gifts, the gifts of God for the people of God. This is a table prepared in the wilderness by a people who are hoping for a feast to come. Let's pray together. God, we thank you uh, for your word. Lord, we thank you for these gifts, for your table, that you have invited us to a meal around the table for all eternity. And God, we just picture now a table uh, as far as the eyes can see with a a, a place for everyone if we would just come and receive. And so Jesus, we pray that you would shape us uh, in this act now, Lord, for your glory. Thank you for the calling you've placed on us. Thank you for going first and most as our perfect prophet, priest, and king, Lord. We love you. In your name, amen. I'm gonna invite the ushers to come forward here at the 930 service. We're gonna serve you in your rows. Uh, There's a double cup, and so go ahead and lift it and separate, and you can find the bread on the bottom. The night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And then he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. There's a new way of doing things. It's offered, it's poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many. This is the Lord's table, not Bethany's table. So all are welcome. We just invite you to do some examination. Ask the Lord as scripture says, see if there's any offensive way in me. And then allow God to invite you to turn and to turn and simply say, Lord, I, I, I need you, I accept this. God wants to do something new in and through you, and it begins at this table. So let's worship together, amen? Amen.